everybody and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name is Gary Williams and I am genuinely excited to have with me today a man who the New York Times described as the crown prince of New York Cabaret. He's been called the quintessence of old style urbanity. And one reviewer said, no one performing today is his equal. I'm thrilled to welcome Steve Ross. Well, nice to be with you. Are you someone who reads your reviews? Because you seem to get quite a lot of nice I ones. I do read them. I can't say that I don't read them. I'm, I always brace myself <laughs> in case they're... But I mean, I come on, I do read them. Sometimes I learn stuff from them. I mean, the reviewers nowadays, I find, are not unreasonable. The people who, the, the people who do review the cabarets are trying to, to give a balanced viewpoint of it. I mean, most of the reviews are online, except in the New York Times, we have one devoted an expert writer named Stephen Holden, who's been at it for years and years and years. And he, he's very um, balanced, I think, for the, in the main. And um, I've always learned from what he says. Of course, there is that, the, the terrifying power of the review. I don't think it's as, as, uh, as hinging as in this country as it is in there. That is one reviewer and his make or break review often happens, but it's, it's somewhat diluted by the fact that there are digital reviewers now. I mean, the bad part about it is that anybody can say, yes, well, I'm a cabaret reviewer for yes. my blog, but there are some worthy and articulate people who write. They just love the medium. They happen to be a, to know how to put words together, and they know the history of it. I mean, I have several in New York, and they've been very kind to me as well. But, you know, it is a, it has to be said, it's, it's a, um, a New York phenomenon. There are cabarets around the country, maybe three or four, but it's not something that has a circuit particularly. I would say maybe out of New York City, there might be uh, seven or eight around the country, but they're modest and they're small, and that's, that's fine. It's just that uh, uh, it, it has to be uh, allowed that it is an urban phenomenon. You're not, even in, I mean, it's a London phenomenon. Mm. May, may, there, maybe there are others in other parts of the, of the UK. I don't think so. It's, it's about what happens to people when they come to these cities. They come to act. They come to, to experience the best of whatever that is. You come to find the best painters and the best symphony orchestras. And it's a challenge to come to it, but people still do. I mean, it was a challenge when I came in the late 60s to New York, but I, in a way, I didn't have really much of a choice. I didn't know what else to do with my life, and uh, music was always part of it. So I decided, after a lot of time, to, to, to come there. And um, I never regretted it. Do you think the scene in London is quite different to that in New York? Do you sort of change things when you're performing, depending on the audience, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on? No. Not at all. Absolutely not. People laugh at the same jokes, they yeah, like absolutely. the same kind of yeah, pacing, know, the same uh, kind of energy. They, and they might know one, one or two references might be slightly um, arcane. But uh, in generally, uh, I mean, if I'm singing a, a lot of Cole Porter songs, and he's filled with references from the 30s that nobody in England or America knows. But you just have to go in. It's a language that you realize, well, gee, if I don't understand, that must be chic. It must be wonderful. So I do it. That's my version. That's because I view my, my brief as uh, singing these songs, there are, which isn't to say that aren't wonderful songs being written now. But to me, it's, it's a gold mine. The songs of the 30s and the 40s, which are now called classic American songbook cabaret, or songbook, uh, they... Um, I will never tire of them, and I think my job, because I know them well, is to keep singing them. We both love Brazil. Brazil, yes, indeed. And so, I mean, in Brazil, presumably it was not an expat audience. Is, it, is Brazilians no, it, there? Well, some. The only thing I do when I travel is, of anybody from that era, is Fred Astaire. Because the movies were the exports. Right. Exports. And they don't know from Broadway. I don't know anybody. Mm. There, were, there was a wonderful producer down there who puts on terrific versions of Broadway shows, but he's, and they're, they're fine. It weren't for him, no one would know anything. But movies are the ones, movies that were shown all over, you know, Cinema Paradiso in, in Italy, you know, they would show them on the back of, in the, in the 30s and 40s, the American movies were the big 
a cultural export. So he is the person from that, and he introduced so many great songs, so I always feature Fred Astaire, and he's the one name they know. Curiously enough, the only composer they know, maybe you have found this too, the only American composer whose name is familiar to them is Gershwin. Hmm. Not Rogers, not Cole Porter, not mm -hmm. Jerome Kern, certainly, but... It's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes Gershwin you're performing the in these... the one. He's the, he's the black, jazzy, influenced composer, and he's the one that is... If anybody known around the world, mm. I don't know. You've found that. Yeah, I, I, I just find it surprising. Sometimes you you, you think there's a, a song that you've been singing for years that mm. you, it goes well everywhere, and then you go to a different country and they just don't know it. And it's, it's so odd that that particular. And then there's another tune that you come across that everybody loves, yeah. and for some reason, like you say, the movies are probably a big movies are reason the for that. I think you would do that. Yeah. You obviously have a great affinity and a, a love for the music of. Fred Astaire, oh, sure. who everybody who thinks of primarily as a dancer, and people are still surprised now. When and I talk about funny, Fred Astaire, say, what are. did he sing? Did he sing anything? Really? Well, of course, he, that? what's that quote by, uh, is it Tony Bennett that said, you know better than I do, something like um, Fred Astaire um, who didn't sing the great American song, but he is the great American, oh, really? something like that, that yeah. yeah. Um, he's uh, had a remarkable influence on the kind of music that we really? love. It's interesting also because he didn't have uh, a wide range in his voice, although he sang with great style and finesse, um, that the songs that were written for him... And there were lots of them. Many, many songs uh, between... I think the record for more songs that became standard is between him and Bing Crosby, in mm. fact, from those early days. But the really gold standards that they wrote for him, they're not very rangy because he couldn't do it. And that ended up being rather nice for the singers. So Mr. Everyman, who thinks, because he makes it look so artless and effortless, maybe he wouldn't say, well, I can dance like that. That might be slightly overweening. But if he hears Fred Astaire sing and not this stentorian voice, he says, oh, well, I can sing a song like that. Most people can, because it's not written in a wide range. And it's, it's fairly easy to sing. And that, I think, is part of the secret why his songs are... Um, Widely known. Because we can all sing along to them. Well, you do, can. It's interesting. Do you think if Fred Astaire had a bigger range that the writing would have been... Mm, I do, rather. I do. Yeah, or had been a different kind of singer, but... So they the, were really writing for him. For him. And but do you think, because he didn't have... In a way, I yeah, mean, in what were. many people would consider the best voice in the world, um, do, do you think we, he's held up on such a pedestal simply because he was the originator, or did he have something really special in his voice? Oh, that's a good point. Um, she, I don't know. Maybe it was um, uh, when you listen to Fred Astaire sing, it's just disarming. I mean, you know that he's singing truthfully and he sings with great jazz style. And it would be hard to pinpoint why his kind of non uh, full, legit sound is popular, other than for the reasons that I've suggested that it's just a pleasant, accessible, sound and these great songs I mean Foggy Day in London Town he just had such a way with phrasing and using these sophisticated words that sounded very pleasant how do you approach this material and whilst avoiding immediate comparisons uh, presumably you wouldn't like it if people thought you were doing some kind of impression mm. you want to find your own voice Indeed. Steve Ross's voice well, in this we well-known material yeah, you have to find your own voice that's the whole point of the cabaret experience it is for the audience to hear someone who has found his or her own voice I mean, they don't they can go and hear someone doing uh, you know Jean Valjean and part of that actor is in that but if you wanted to hear the person you know, that's, that's, been, that's our, our, our uh, mandate, if you will. I mean, that's our job, is to put ourselves into the act. I, in fact, um, so I, am point, never, I, I have never had a problem with listening to, to other people sing because I don't, I don't have confidence in all parts of my life, but I, I know that my voice is singular, and, and it is what its own... And it's, it's there. I mean, maybe I wouldn't sing what over the rainbow or something that's really identified with someone. But actually, I, do, I feel very confident in singing anything, and I always go to the sheet music, especially from that era, because we think that they spend a lot of time with those vocal arrangements when Cole Paul, All of that sheet music that you buy 
books of Cole Porter, books of George Gershwin, though they approve, they spend a lot of time with those arrangements for the home user. Mm. And I always look for the voicings because I'm a pianist myself. How does this go? Does this? Oh, oh I see. Put that chord here. So I, I always go. I didn't used to. In the beginning, when I started playing just in cocktail lounges, there was a thing called a fake book. They still have them. We still have them. We still have Except them. Except they're on digital now. They, oh, yes, for the first time I saw that. <laughs> I used to have to schlep these huge books to the piano <laughs> like bar. Like a lawyer or something. With this and then trolley. now I, somebody said, what's your request? He just looks on his iPod and plays it. But they just have the chord symbols. Mm. And so you, you get the tune up, but you don't get the, the sound of the tune uh, a lot. Mm. Except the little 20s ditty is fine, but if you have a composer that has any sophistication at all, like Berlin or certainly Cole Porter, and then when you get into people like Kurt Weill and Sondheim and Bernstein. So I always buy the original sheet music. I always go to that. And I go away from it if I need to. But to me, that's the, that's the Bible. Do you allow yourself to go away from it much? I mean, do you, are you mind, do you think, if the composer was sitting next to me now, would they approve? Mm. Do you think like that? Or do you think, well, it's my job to bring a new interpretation? More the latter. <laughs> Sometimes composers get very uptight about that. Legendarily, Sondheim does, and Richard Rodgers, and all that, because it's their children. But I, um, it doesn't bother me. I, I no, I, I'm, I'm trying to certainly respect the truth, mainly of the harmonies and of the words. I mean, and whenever I teach classes or work with, with young singers, we just start off being contrary. And you say, well, how else can we do this tune? Fast tune, slow. Slow tune, fast. Uh, a modern song in an old style, back and forth. Put a bossa nova to it. So you try to, you try to everything has to loosen up the performer's idea of that, because we've all heard versions of that. I mean, I, for example, but you listen, you, you study the lyric and you say, what is the lyric trying to say? Do you think it all starts with the lyric? Yeah, to me it does, because I can, um, I can put a make, if, and, and that's something's really awful, but even uh, what one might call a trite melody. You can kind of gussy it up with chords and everything like that, and you, even if it's not the most original melody, but you can't really, unless it's a good lyric, you can't really mess around with it. I'm not about to change that. I can kind of change a harmony in the music, but that was M Mabel Mercer, the, the doyenne of all of us who does all of this. And she was, would look at the lyric first, and if the lyric spoke to her, then one might presume that you can make the music work. But the lyric is, because this is a word media, cabaret is wonderful, it's a word media. It's not about high notes, it's not about necessarily pear-shaped tones, and, and I, oddly enough, that's the back door that I entered, because I didn't have a big, legit voice. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big, legit mm -hmm. voice. But when I heard people like Astaire, and, and the crooners, for example, in the 30s and 40s, I said, well, I could, I could do that. It wasn't mm. so rangy. So I came in realizing that, it, that I could do the words and I could make sense out of the words and sing the words. And then since then, I've had a lot of teachers and I have a voice now that is, has many, much more arranged to it than I had in the beginning. But in the beginning, I just sang wordy songs, point songs, as you call them here. Because mm. I was working in a bar and they said, we have to sing too. We don't want to hire another person. So economics, I started singing. And, just funny little musical songs. It's almost like I? the way that uh, Nat King Cole started. He, I mean, he wasn't a singer. He was known really? as a jazz pianist. Yeah, he was known as a jazz well, pianist. Well, he had the trio. When I read that about uh, you, I thought, well, you've got something in common with Nat Cole there, mm. and that's how your voice, you've really due to demand that your voice, uh, you even found your voice. I found my voice. I, had a, I always had my piano bar experience. I was working in Washington, and a guy came over. He was obviously with some lady he was trying to impress. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps they had not been joined in matrimony. I'm not quite sure. And he said, can you play the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto? <laughs> and I said, oh, what is that joke? No, I, I don't play classical music. He was trying to be cut. He said, can you play the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto? This was at 5 o'clock in a bar in a hotel. And I said, no, I can't really. What he meant was, uh, as in many of those classical themes, the, it had been turned into a pop song. You may or may not know that. That was a vogue in the 40s. So what he wanted me to play was da 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 which was called Tonight We Love. That's what he'd heard. 
Then he said, then it dawned on me, that's what he wanted. He said, would you play the Tchaikovsky piano concerto for $35? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I did. Tony and he came back, I played, came back with somebody else, and I played it again. I got another $35. Anything you it's want. It's called practicality in yeah. music. Tony Bennett tells a similar story about when, he was, when the mob were, was running the clubs, and he's like, will you play, will you sing this song? No, 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 I don't. Will you sing mm. this song? And then someone gets out a gun. Will you sing this song? Oh, well, Off I love he goes, my One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Mabel Mercer, who is uh, considered today as sort of a gold standard of, of cabaret. What, what is it that made her so special? Well, I was very lucky because I saw her in the 60s. Wow. And uh, I, I came up to New York. I was living in Washington, and I, I experienced her. We got to be, you know, friendly, and I was very... Uh, this is right at the beginning of your career, really. Yep, absolutely. And... Um, well, she was a deserves, as they say, at the end of her life, although she had begun with a beautiful, natural voice, she went in the direction that we're talking about. I mean, she ended up singing great material, very classy songs. People would write songs for her, and she would sing them, but she sang. She would go to a show, hmm, that song. Hmm. And uh, she was very audacious, because uh, you never knew when, when you went to one of her recitals, I guess, what they were. Uh, she would sit there. She was famous for sitting with mm -hmm. her robe and, and just kind of holding forth. Uh, she sang Mira. It's a song from Carnival. I can come from a town of Mira, sung by an 18-year-old little French girl. How did she make that work? Mm. She did. It was touching. She sang, then she sang a Judy Collins song, Both Sides Now. And I said, well, that makes sense. She is an older woman. It's both sides. She's looked at life from both sides. So she would saw that lyric and said, there's something in there that I can relate to. Mm. We all come from some place to go to New York. So she thought, well, it doesn't have to be a little town. But metaphorically, there is a mirror in all of us. I come from the town. Everybody knew my name. It was safe there, but I came to New York. Mm. And I've lived, I don't know anything about love or life, but I've lived it. So the idea is to find songs with, that relate to you and check out those lyrics and see if they can mean it. I wish, uh, it is my regret that I just don't have the time and or, I won't say energy, but I probably couldn't. I'm very much toiling in those vineyards. I don't really have the, uh, the uh, ability to look at uh, more modern songs mm. that... I could mine, but if somebody said, now you do a show of songs from the 70s, or, I think I tuned out at the end of the 70s, I'm sorry. Folk rock, great, melodies, nice emotions. Then we moved into bands and things like that. It was more difficult to turn that. I still sing songs by, you know, people like whom? Hey, Jim Croce, that's the one. <laughs> I just came to your rescue there. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, but. Those are wonderful songs, and when I when I work with students, some of the I bring those in because they have Carol King. I mean, come on, Carly Simon, Judy mm. Mitchell, Paul Simon. Do you think if even if you had the time uh, to to mine, as you call it, for mm. uh, more contemporary repertoire, do you think it would be a good idea? In that you're so well known and so well loved for what you do, um, that the audience might not respond to it in the same mm. way they do already. I always had to joke that I would be doing, I announced that I'm doing a new album called Ross Sings the Boss, yes. the Bruce Springsteen yeah. album. No way. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. No, no, no. I mean, a late note or a breakfast show. No, I figured I'd develop my audience and they might buy a couple of them. So, oh, that's interesting. But they, they will want what I've developed doing, so it would not be particularly practical as far as employment goes. Mm. It might be nice. But Barb Younger it. seems very adept at taking contemporary music yeah, and she, somehow she, yeah. making it fit she, into the one, our yeah. genre. She, she does that. She does that. She deconstructs these songs yes. and, and, and somehow, you know, it's, you're she's halfway, she's no halfway through a tune yeah. and you're thinking, I think I know it. Where do I know and this from? And suddenly you realise. From, from a band. Do you have, have you done that yourself? Not much. Taking uh, songs from a later... You know, era, and maybe that lyric means something if you take it away. D d I, I'm like you in that I, I, I do think there is a lot of very good contemporary writing around, but I'm so overwhelmed yeah. by the great 
standards we have a lot to that do I've hardly we have touched a big anyway. Job. Yeah, and I, I'm working on a, a few songs at the minute by uh, Alec Wilder, oh, who's yes. not often heard. Not and there's a great repertoire there. And so I'm sort of busy working on the stuff that I that I sort of know before I move on to the stuff that I don't know so well. In the book uh, Cabaret Secrets, for which you made a, a, some wonderful contributions to, there's a, a section I spent a lot of time talking about chat and the patter. And it, it seems from most people I talk to that the, the chat is at least as important as the songs. But I noticed, I saw just a DVD of Mabel Mercer. I never got a chance well, to see, see it before. You, I, you I, have I, seen that. Yeah, she's sitting, uh, down. sitting down. Um, I think she's in the Oak Room, maybe, or I'm not sure where there it would have been. There was another so. room that she played in those days. But anyway, it's like that. And um, I noticed, I, I don't know if it was just edited for the DVD, no. but well, she, I know didn't, where you're going. she didn't talk. Never said a word. So I was amazed she at this. She murmured the next song, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> she would say, you know, San Francisco. Murmured, and then you saw her mouth going, thank you. She never said anything, never. That's a, releva a, a revelation to me because I, you know, it's everybody that I talk mm -hmm. to. It's a huge thing. It's the chat, the r rapport mm -hmm. that we get with the other. But she, being this gold standard, I thought they must have edited that. Why didn't she chat? I have no idea. She chose not to. And so. And um, yet she's still. But it was a full evening. You didn't yeah. feel cheated? Did you feel that she, it sounds a, a little hokey, but did she talk through her songs? I yes, mean, was that everything saying. she wanted to say she, was in the it music? It all was there. And when I, I mean, somebody gave me a tape that I made in the 1970s, or 80, early 80s, and a, at a job in Washington, D.C. And I put it on. I never said anything. I never said anything in between the song. Maybe one thing, this is a song by Stephen Sondheim. I was shocked. Because I started talking, I guess, maybe when I went to the Algonquin in the early 80s, because uh, the man who was producing me there, Donald Smith, said, oh, let's do tributes. And of course, tribute shows are so powerful on Broadway and on Cabaret. That that's so, it's great that they do them. But let's do a tribute to, I think, with Jerome Kern. So we have to tell the audience a little bit about it. So I did some research. So that was the first time I talked. And then you realize, well, I just can't give facts. You try to embellish it. And um, and then you you know tell a story or so. But Sinatra, he didn't chat much about himself. He would give the song a who wrote it and and who arranged it. But I, I would. Was, I, I, it's it's a tough one to say that, that the Sinatra was really. I wouldn't call him a cabaret performer. Oh, I see. You're making that as if we're in the cab. Oh, you mean that the cabaret medium might require more of it that? It seems so to me. It's I mean, if you're idea. in a small, Could intimate be. space, I mean, it goes on to the whole thing. The question I'm asking everybody all the time is, what is cabaret? And one of the, it seems that it's, it's hard to define, but it seems that it's about a certain intimacy, uh, breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Uh, it can be done in a large place. I know you've played Carnegie Hall, mm. haven't you? And, do, yeah. and and would you chat to the audience? And Would you try and get that same kind of intimacy and, and sort of one-on-one -on -one rapport that you might have in the Oak Room? Um, uh, I think you might kind of not want to. They, there's a thing called the Cabaret Convention that has been held in New York for many, many years. The Mabel Mercer Cabaret Mabel Convention. Mercer, by the, and um, they have cabaret artists coming on the stage of a big theater. And uh, sometimes we talk, but I think the idea is more of a concert thing. You wouldn't chat so much. I, I tend not to. I tend to do the song and get off. Doesn't but, that go against the essence of what cabaret is? Yes, it is, but by the same token, it's an opportunity to perform, and you can get, you know, several, several hundred people into the hall, and so people get to see mm. I find it really seven hard. or eight if, 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 if I'm asked to, to do just one or two songs, I find it hard because I, I want to talk. I want to. I, 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 I want to, to them on a set the th Yeah, exactly that. And even I used to. Um, um, a lot of the work that I do, as you know, is on cruise ships. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, sometimes, you know, we'll have our 50-minute show, and then occasionally we'll go on a ship, and they'll say, "Oh, we only need 40 minutes tonight, yes, or, I know. or, or dinner, something." Yeah. And now I used to hear other artists really get upset about this. How can I, you know, and I used to say, well, they're asking you to work less. Surely that's, well, you know, have another 10 minutes in the bar and enjoy yourself. And it was only actually relatively recently, after 20 years of me doing this, that I, I find it really hard now to cut things mm. because every song, every bit of, everything is there for a reason. One thing leads to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. It's a flow, there's a journey. It's not just a set. 
it's a show. And so if they want me to take out three songs in the middle, well, it's a predicament of how I'm going to go from, you know, there to there. Um, do, do you, uh, does this resonate with you at all, or am, am I being too fussy? I'm, no, am I getting, am I becoming a diva? No, no, you wouldn't. Have. Not you. <laughs> a diva, maybe. Not a diva. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of... Um, it's not something that I'm really good. There is a there is a lot of conversation about the flow of a cabaret show, and but to me, perhaps it's a little more arbitrary than one thinks it is. Um, like I'm doing a show next week here at Crazy Cox called uh, Through the Years, which is a musical memoir. So I'm, I'm going back and taking a lot of songs from various chunks of my life. But it, I have to say, it's, in a way, I'm not another friend. You know Robert Hopperman. Oh, lovely, yeah. Wonderful singer, very smart guy. And he does shows here, and, and he does shows in his shows. But he, has, he calls them in modules. So he has a chunk here that if they wanted a shorter show, he takes that out, and somehow he has, it's able to be linked from the other. But mm. to be honest with you, if it, I put all the cards on the table, literally, literally on the piano, all my, this is how I do my shows, in case the audience is interested. All, all the songs there. I look at all of them. Say if I'm doing a show. Is this is join the set. No, so no, 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 so this is, is preparing. When you're putting it together. So you have a list of all of the songs that you Say do. Irving Berlin. Yeah. I look, what are the, all the Irving Berlin songs that I have? So you write out a big list. Big out list. I put the, each of them on a small card. Ah. Uh -huh. The cards are separated. It's like this. I put them on the piano, and I stare at it for a couple of days. This is really how I do it. I, uh, I've opened with that before. Do I want to open with that? What if I open with this? And little by little, it's like a Ouija board. I never yes. thought about it. These cards seem to find their way. Well, this is a good opening number, because if I do that one, I always like this is every, every, I always like comedy early on in the show. That is the one of the constants that I do is mm. I put a little bit of comedy up front because that number one relaxes the audience and makes them one because they can be they can come in with chips on their shoulders, but if they laugh, they all laugh. It kind of breaks down a wonderful barrier. Mm. So I put a comedy song up front, and they oh they go oh this guy's all right. He can make me laugh. He looks okay. The hair is done. The hair. so. Uh, so that was a comedy up there. I said, well, here's about time. Oh, ballad, no, that's too early for that serious about it. Let's put that toward the end. So I have the, that's all, because I've already somehow figured out the ending song. Do you tend to work on the ending I first? I the ending, or? I don't want to get the opening. Let's end with, it should be something fairly rousing. All right, cheek to cheek, let's do cheek to cheek and put that there. And then a couple of, before that, we need a kind of a big ballad vague contours of the 11 o'clock spot, as we used to call them. And in the middle, oh, I'm gonna need another comedy number down about here, three inches down on the piano. And then <laughs> maybe here at about seven and a <laughs> half. So little by little, I can't do two ballads. Can I take them in a ballad to a place that they might want to stay there for another ballad? Hmm, I think I will. And besides, these ballads have an unconscious theme. Mm. So little by little, but I don't, I'm not so, how do I say, bound to find the connection with every one. I think if the songs are good, and they have a general feeling of variety, you don't mm, want to bore mm, the audience. Mm. Um, I could shuffle all them around. I could, oh, let's put the opening here. Mm. On the, oh, I'm sure that th there is no sacrosanct order in a cavalry So show. it's more about the, your priority is actually finding a good flow for, for the, I mean, just because flow. it's a good I'll song. I'll give you flow. Mm. Mm. Flow is nice. Mm. Up tune, down tune, comedy, taking the four constituents yes. or the five constituents. The sort of shape of the show. show. You're not getting too head up about, oh, well, this was written a decade before, or no, this was by a different writer. You're not worried about no, that. You're no, just about presenting that. the songs in the way that makes the, the audience uh, um, uh, enjoy themselves. And really. remember, one of the atmos, uh, one of the uh, nice attributes of a cabaret performance is surprise. Mm. Do you like to surprise yourself? I don't know. You mean when I'm watching someone else? No, I'm thinking when you do your what own you show, do you have a little bit, a, a section of the show where you think, 
I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing there? Or do you often change what you know? You spend all this time, three days, looking at your little cards, and you get it all set. <laughs> the way you do it. <laughs> yes. Does some, so somebody speak to you halfway through a set? No, and you no, think, no. Put that away. <laughs> Glitter and big A is a ballad. No, no, no. <laughs> you sound like you've been there before <laughs> and decided, no, no, no best I can't just stick do that. to the no, plan. No, I don't. Like, for example, this one is unusual that I would do such a, a very. See, the thing is, I've gotten such a reputation, and quite happily so, for doing tribute shows to Porter, to the Kirschmans and the piano, all my six or seven great ladies and gents, that doing a mixed show, which I love to do when I'm asked to do a show by someone who just oh, sing a show at our benefit, I do a mixed show. Mm -hmm. I have my opening, and that's all set, and I, have, I take from everything and things that are not by a given composer or not from an era. That's my favorite kind of show, because mm. then I can really surprise people. But the element of surprise is important. Mm. So mm. there's, oh, number one, it's a surprise of, oh, you know, I never heard that song that way. That's a great treat to do mm. that. So when mm -hmm. I work with students or I work with singers, try it this way. Uh, for example, not being a big singer, and I hit an Alan J. Luna show, not mm. so far. And I have a fantastic director that I've been working with for years and years, Duncan Knowles. I think you may have met him. Yeah, at Duncan, he's great. Wonderful, great insight. And he's not a, he's a director of shows, but he and I are friends, and he just happens to have a great sense of me and of the song. It's not what he does. So he's not a cabaret director. He's not, except that he able to work with me on this. Like I might not be something, but yet I could do it. Not a brain surgery, of course, but so we sit around and we do the same thing. We put the cars on the piano, and he's my extra set of eyes and ears. Yes, yes. So he said, you know, I have to do something from Camelot. What do I want to do? What would be surprising? I often give myself the task in preparation. How can I surprise the audience with a song that they've heard a hundred times? So I go, I try to do that, not necessarily with every song, but I try to look at every song, what would be the possibilities? If I wanted to do this in a different way, how could I do it? Mm. I don't necessarily um, end up doing it that way, but I like to look at each song and its options. So I said, well, how can I do, if ever I would leave you, the big ballad from the show, mm -hmm. Robert Goulet. So I ended up doing very quietly. I looked at the words and I said, can the words support uh, a, a, a more lyrical and quiet in, in, in interpretation. Of course they can, mm. before I would leave you. What if you're whispering this into someone's ear mm. or you're writing it in a letter? Mm. So I, I, and then it seemed to be quite effective. People, gee, I never heard that before. That's good because they're thinking about the song. Yes, yes. And I think the, the, the part of the job of the cabaret singer is to, is number, is to make people think anew about these songs, mm -hmm. especially if they've come knowing them, like the mm -hmm. middle-aged or older crowd. That's right, because if, if, you, if we approach, if we're singing a song that's very well known, it comes with a whole set of assumptions. It They're actually not so much the, yeah. listening to the words. They're just thinking, oh, it reminds me of when I was... Which oh, is I nice. Like, that's which nice. is a nice thing in itself, but actually far better for them to really get absorbed in, in your performance of the song and really listen yeah. to the words and for them to sort of rediscover uh, the emotion effect of it all over again. They can. There are two ways of looking at it. I mean, that when you go to a play, the audience is asked to participate in, if you will, again, that time-used word, journey. They're asked to come along, so they want to pay attention. Where is this going? Oh, the plot. Oh, he's taking... So it's a more of a participatory mm. experience mm. than going maybe to a lounge when you're not the audience is not required and or expected to join in so much. They want to hear, oh, do that Barbara Streisand song. Mm -hmm. And we can't get Barbara, but can you sing it like her? <laughs> sing that Tony Bennett song. They want to hear those. Yeah. It, they're not, their expectation and the requirement is different. Except a very good cabaret, the style that you do, can be different. It, it, you're, you, what you're doing is you're in, in, in revisiting songs and giving the new interpretations, you're actually making it more of uh, a two-way that's what I want. I'm, I want them to, to go along with me, which isn't to say you don't want to give them, uh, as you know, you don't want to give them a whole hour of unfamiliar. It's too much work. Mm. Too much work. You have to be judicious in, in, in your selection. I mean, if you're working out of town, you don't want any unknown songs. Nothing. You're working, you know, but these days the audiences have become to expect a little bit of that. 
adding a, adding a little bit of unknown stuff. And they can say, I know, I like it because I know all the songs. And it might be easier to uh, surprise me as an audience member with something I didn't know rather than, I mean, there's two songs, there's some songs I never want to hear again. <laughs> I will tell you who they I are. I bet I sing them. Oh, no. <laughs> Brilliantly. <laughs> oh, good recovery. Maybe I don't ever <laughs> want to hear that my heart sinks when I hear the first three notes. Look at me. <laughs> it's going to be someone well, really good. But, you know what? Hits, I'm sure. but you know what? If they, if they did that and then uh, four bars later they'd, they'd given such they such yeah. a, 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 a an unusual then, uh, then reading of the song you'd well, be thrilled wouldn't you i would be thrilled yeah but I'm saying that's the, the cabaret. And that's problem. our challenge as performers. Anybody listening to this, that's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. To, to keep um, regular uh, cabaret audience members, people with some level of sophistication, yeah. understanding keep about the music, interested. to keep them interested. But at the same time, it's that difficult balancing act of people that are coming along for the first time that would love to hear it in the original way, yeah. that they're not going to think, oh, he ruined that song. It's to try and keep both sides happy, isn't it? It's a yeah, challenge. Very much so. I mean, yeah, I mean, I... There are some songs that I probably wouldn't touch, but maybe I would. I mean, let's look at a song that is so consecrated to some one singer, and yet I've heard many people sing it. It would say Over the Rainbow, mm. which is the world knows is a mm. Judy Garner song. But I've heard it's a beautiful song, and I've heard I'm sure I could sing it and please myself and please the audience very nicely mm. because they, I want to have an echo of what they know, mm. but I myself, because I just have developed a confidence in myself, I don't have an every area of my life, as I said, but I know that I can, that I, no one's ever sung it the way I sing it, and mm. gentle readers, no one will ever sing it the way you sing it. Mm. Mm. If you are in touch with your feelings Once you've about found it. that, yes, if exactly. If you're in touch with your feelings about it. And that's, that's this important thing, isn't it? Because it, rather than thinking, oh, I'll do this song because everybody knows it, and I know that, the, or I won't do this song, because you, we, we should perhaps be choosing songs primarily on the basis, as you were talking about Mabel Mercer, that actually resonate with us. Because if that's the, that's the first thing, because if we really do feel some personal, strong connection mm -hmm. with any particular song, then that's going to help Probably us to deliver a good performance, isn't oh, it? Absolutely. Our own performance. Oh, yeah. No. Rather than just doing it because, oh, I know they'll like this. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's valid enough, depending on the circumstances. I mean, mm. if you're playing for a group of tired businessmen, then... And, oh, you're that Fred Astaire guy. You're not going to sing a song that was dropped from a show. You're going to sing his hits <laughs> and sing them well, and you'll have a good time doing it. Yes, I haven't yet done a selection from Watertown in a Sinatra tribute oh. show. I better just stick to <laughs> yes. New York, New York, I think. That might be another... I would come to hear you. <laughs> I know you you're would. You might be the only singer. one. I would love to hear your take on do that. You, um, do you think that that's one of the things that Duncan, you're uh, directed in, in being a, another set of eyes and ears, that, and, and, and perhaps it helps that he's not... It's not what he, he no, does. He, doesn't, he mean, comes from from a point of view as a, as a, as a, as a punter. Uh, Just as a punter, he doesn't know the music. He knows, I mean, he teaches at Mount Fury, but not, not music, he teaches the Alexander technique. But he just has an interest in music. Mm. But he is, he is looking at it as, what if I, if I, because he also teaches poetry there, so if I wanted to read a poem, he would bring his set, the same criteria. Mm. Is it truthful? Does it, how does it affect you? And so it's been very interesting of him not being a cabaret person particularly. He doesn't even go to many cabarets except me. <laughs> he doesn't. He it's doesn't, funny, he doesn't right? enjoy them. It's funny, right? It, that is, it works uh, for you. And yet he's, it's, it, it's very nice if you can find, uh, a lot of people do this in the beginning, especially if you can find a pianist. Singers, I'm lucky because I live with my pianist, me. <laughs> But singers, you don't have to pay him a penny. No, not a penny. But singers often ally themselves. I don't know whether you do, because on the, on the cruise ships are different. You have to have charts that work. But singers uh, ally themselves often with a pianist and grow with that pianist, mm. and then they, they know the, how to do it. It's but a collaboration. Good, yeah, but, but good, good pianists can... I mean, it's not a sine qua non. Good pianists can figure out something if the charts are written well. And that's, that's a little bit different. Say you're used to working with X, and... Um, you know, that's the contour of the song, but Y comes along and puts something in there. It makes it a little livelier, it makes mm. it nice. 
Do you have that when you work with different groups? If, if one group is good and the other group is a group but different? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, and it's always right. refreshing to work. I've just recently, I've been working with some, before I came to see you today, I was rehearsing with a pianist I haven't worked and seen with for 15 years. Really? And it was really nice. Nathan Martin, you probably know oh, Nathan. Oh, no, Nathan. He's very yeah. skillful. And it was really nice to just have a refreshing right. approach to some songs. And, and of course, it affects the way that I sing them. Yeah. Can you uh, imagine yourself doing what you do without the aid of a director? Or do you think, I mean, anybody listening to this starting out, do you think you, know, you, you need a good pianist if you don't play piano and you need to find a good director? Do you think someone can be successful mm. without the director? Uh, yeah, they always say directors came about later. Mabel Mercer never had a director. She would laugh at that. Right. Bobby Short, another marvelous pianist from those days of great stuff. The director thing came in decades later. I don't know, even know how it came in. I'm glad it did because it was very helpful to me. Uh, you know what it helps? It helps you in winnowing out things because I, I, you get an affection for a song and you think, well, this is truthful. When I heard Mabel sing that song, I said, well, I can sing anything, can't I? And, um, and then I started singing a couple of songs. That I'll never forget one night I was in a bar and I had just discovered uh, Janis Joplin. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I love that song, Take Another Little Piece of My Heart. He said, Take Another Little. I said, I can sing that. And stony silence I was met with. <laughs> Don't ever <laughs> sing that song again. But I loved it. And I, even to this day, I will sing a bunch of songs. And Duncan said, well, they're nice, but. Didn't used to be that polite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just because I like them and just because they resonate isn't necessarily uh, going to be good for the performance. A director, some friends, some informed friends. You don't have to hire a director, yes, which yes, can yes. be a cost. It's just yeah. another set another, of eyes and ears, isn't it, that you that? can trust? Yes, you, know, you could just say five people. What do you sing? You sing a bunch of songs for five people. Because you can't, we can't count. When you finish a show, hopefully everybody, if they're quite polite, is going to tell you how marvellous you were, and that's what you want to hear. It doesn't count, does it? You need no. someone to, the next day to sit yes, down over a coffee and say, here's, here's how it really was. Yeah, here's how it is, and I was... But they have, they have to be kind, too, because you're very vulnerable when we go up on stage. But, and I've had people not be. I mean, I've developed a carapace, if that's mm -hmm. the right word. You know, you kind of do it, and, but uh, very vulnerable right after you've sung. And yeah, I hate to admit it. I, I did a show um, a few months ago. It was a lunchtime show. Ronnie Scott's here in London. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I think of myself as not being too fussy, and I'll just get on with it, you know, and mm. so on. I don't think, I don't feel like I'm too sensitive. But I, obviously, I'd spent a long time preparing this show. Mm. The place was full. It was a great reaction. Everybody, you know, it was a good, successful show. Everybody's happy. I felt very pleased. Meeting some friends in the pub down the road for a drink after the show. And the first person I bumped into was a friend of a friend. And he said, oh, oh, I didn't like it when you, you know what you should do, you should, and, and he started giving me these notes. So, um, and I was, it really pissed me horrible. off. And that then I was sort of questioning myself that that bothered me so much. But, you know, and then I thought, you know what, I've just done this show in front of whatever it is, you know, 200 people for sort of two hours. Yeah. And I think it's OK that you come off and, and, and need your peers, you know, your friends to say, well done, great. Yeah. Maybe the next day someone can say, didn't really like it when you did this, or maybe you should think if about their doing less opinion of that. opinion is solicited. I mean, I know we all have, we have our, our egos are not necessarily fragile, and sometimes uh, I have had the occasion if someone who is a little less graceful about the whole thing, uh, so I'm able to get rid of me, get rid of the ego thing, and yes. just brace myself and saying, <laughs> is that maybe this original reaction is valuable? So I kind of go over my, my delicate <laughs> ego. And, and I said, oh, well, okay, then, I mean, I, it may not be something, but most people would ask, is, I've got a couple of ideas for me, would you like to hear them? I said, yeah. maybe let me work on it myself and maybe I can talk to you in a couple That's of a nice days. way of doing it, actually, for, uh, and that's good for all of us when we see somebody else, one of our peers, and we see, because we do sometimes see shows, don't we, and we think, gosh, if, if only these, they yeah, knew if the this. Abonies. Ah, if I, if I was kept doing that thing with my arm, I'd love someone to tell me. Uh, so, and, and so you watch and you think, and afterwards and you think, I really want to tell them about their arm. And, but it, it, you, you have to yeah. very lightly suggest it. You have to wait to be asked, really. And sometimes, yeah. that's why I try and make an effort to ask. If there's somebody, if you were watching my show, I would certainly say to you, Steve, would you do me the honor of just looking at, while, you know, being, maybe noting some things down, remembering, if there's anything you see that I should know, please tell me. Because I would want to open that invitation to you mm -hmm. so that the next day when we meet for coffee, that you can feel comfortable to say, well, you did ask, 
So here's something. I think it's up to us as performers to open that door for other people to, 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 to have yeah. uh, comments because uh, 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 well-mannered and sensitive people probably will just keep it themselves if we don't ask. But then you have to learn, you know. I mean, uh, you take a genius and he's not, he's not going to be, he's going to tread on you. Classic example of a people like Jerry Robbins, may he rest in peace, apparently. He was uh, horrible, apparently. Mm, mm. Brilliant, though. But he was so brilliant that you just... Yeah. And then he says, yeah, put that here. I don't know. I never was there. But reports say that he could be really rough on someone. Or a, yeah. a brilliant director. Somehow they like to stir the pot and they try to use, in the, in the theater situation, they try to use the emotions and get people all riled up. Yes, and maybe yes, they can yes. make some gold out of that. But uh, sometimes just to put that aside. My, many people just have a lot to tell you, but they don't necessarily have the graceful way to do it. But uh, Duncan and I, only he and I have worked out, but that's why I have uh, run-throughs, and I often ask opinion. Yes. And it's interesting, sometimes I can have a song that this is, so, I mean, I've been doing it for 50 years, but still, I have a song, ah, a sure, a sure hit, this is new, they're going to love it, and I start singing it just in front of people, mm -hmm. and halfway through, it's, it's dying the death. Mm, and I mm. just know somehow in the air, it, mm. it can't... It's funny happen. what you can... I, 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 I can practice stuff mm. till the cows come home, and I know it, I'm all over it, and I feel very comfortable. As soon as there are other people listening, yeah, it's in a sort of a performance mode. It's different, phenomenon. isn't it? Very interesting phenomenon. Somehow it focuses the mind or something. No, 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 yeah. No, it does. And uh, When you do these run-throughs... You just mentioned. Mm. Um, do you do the whole, the, the chat, the, the links, the everything you're doing, like almost like a dress I rehearsal? I try to do a dress rehearsal. And this it. is for a this isn't a, this isn't a paying audience. This is a I'm half a dozen friends. people, just them, you that know, you get in, say, come round to the flat, cheap and, wine, and yeah, and so bowls of peanuts, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, they're very, very helpful because I have informed friends that they, and they I, I, they're informed. Can, I mean, they go to a lot of cabarets, so they're not professionals, but they are in fact professionals. Of the fact that they, mm. they know these songs and they know me, or sometimes they bring. Me, yeah, I've got a friend in town. Me, yeah, I bring. Yeah, does she have any interest in these songs? Well, no, mm. but she might be an audience member mm, 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 mm. that was brought along by his wife or whatever. And mm. say, you want to reach them too. You don't want to do it just for the mm. Illuminati. Mm, 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 you know? mm. How do you deal with nerves? I don't have as bad a nervous as I used to. Paralyzed in the beginning. Mm. Awful. Terrible. And um, um, I just don't, you know, I, it, it took a long time to get over that. How about, mm. do you have a... You, you I, I, I do have nerves sometimes. I always say, for me, it depends on the number of new elements there are. So, if I'm working in a new room, Th so it could be a new room, it could be a new musical director, it could be a new song, yeah. there could be a new lighting new guy, song. a new sound guy, Me. some new shoes, a suit I haven't worn oh, before. The, the I'm the new worried, yeah, I'm worried if the shirt that I'm wearing, which is brand new, where the cuff's going to get caught on the outside of the jacket. Oh. When I, you know, if I want to move around where, I, where, where the light's going to catch oh. me, will I remember the, song, the, the words to the bridge? Uh, the, I'm in a new town, I'm in a new country. Are they going to mm. understand what I'm saying? There are many things which make up a show, and the more new elements there are, the more nervous I get. So if all the things that I've just mentioned were new, if I'm playing with a brand new yep. musical director singing a song I've never sung before, in a country I've never been before, in a room I've never worked before, with a sound guy and a microphone, I've done, sure I'm going to be terrified, <laughs> you know. Um, if, if I'm comfortable with everything, then maybe yeah. I'll put two or three new songs in the middle because I, and, and I will put them in the middle. I won't open with them, for example. Yeah, no, this is I, I tend to, for safety's sake, I tend to open broadly speaking, with the same numbers. Yeah. I mean, it depends which too. shows. There are a few different shows. I, I open with something that's absolute rock solid, and my first bit of chat, what I call my welcome chat, mm -hmm. is always going to be pretty much the same. Because yeah. I don't want to be worried about that. I want to get in, I get settled, get my confidence there, and, uh, and then, then I can start to play around. Yeah, I, I do pretty much the same thing. But those demons, you know, I mean, it... it we... Uh, how do I put this? The, those nervous things, the little imps on your shoulder, mm. that, that all of the things that say um, you can't, all those things in, in our life that saying you can't do that, mm. you, you're a mm. little, you know, and, and it, it might bring up disapproval that we've had as kids or mm. what brings us to do this kind of work in the first place. It's just a different, so you have to get rid of them, just, and, and you have to say, well, uh, often I do it, uh, well, what if I didn't have 
this misgiving? What if I didn't have the voice telling me? Well, if I didn't have the voice, I'd sing the hell out of this song. Yeah. I love this song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you do have to dance with your mind a yeah, little bit yeah, yeah. and say, well, all right, I, um, in a way, all right, I'll listen to you. You're right. I'm rubbish. I can't sing. But I'm not going to think about it right now. Tonight, let's, I mean, let me deal with you later and agree with you because, of course, I'm crap. But for now, I'm going to sing it. But I just go to the song. Mm. And I go to the song. And then I uh, sort of immerse yourself go in to it. my job as giving the song. I yes. mean, I remember hearing that from in England and America. It was in some movie that had a pub in it. And they had the wonderful old pub pianist. And she said, hello, give us a song. And I'd never heard that phrase, give us a song. In uh -huh, America, right, it's really. an English thing. Right, right, right. Give us a song. I said, that's not, I'm going to give you a song. That's don't nice. give us yourself. We don't necessarily need Give us a song, Floss, whatever it was. And she got up and she gave the song. And I said, basically, if I did nothing but that, if I just sang the song, even without my angst and my stroma, it's a good song. I've given them something. And that takes away a little bit of the nerves. Well, I can do that. That's great advice. You are going to be giving us lots of songs here this week. We're at the Crazy Cox now. It's been so great to talk to you today. Thank I you. know I have to let you go because it's rehearsal time yeah. for you. But thank you for sharing all of I your secrets. I'm going to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'll give you some branding. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Good luck to you. Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love. <laughs> <laughs>